Okay, so today's webinar is all about inspiring writing through quality texts. And for this, I'm very pleased to say that we are again joined by Margaret Fennell and Joe Shackleton. Margaret and Joe are the authors of Bite Into Writing, which is NFER's new suite of writing resources for Year 6. Each Bite Into Writing resource is based on a quality public published text. So in this third webinar, they're going to be looking at how quality texts can inspire quality writing in the classroom. They'll be considering the question of how to choose texts and also thinking about the tasks and activities that are likely to promote quality writing. I've been working very closely with Margaret and Joe as they've been developing the Bite Into Writing materials. So before I hand over to them, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the authors themselves. Margaret and Jo have worked together for almost 10 years now. And as you can see from this slide, they've got a wealth of literacy experience to share. They've worked on behalf of England's Standards and Testing Agency on the National Curriculum Tests and on Teacher Assessment, where they helped to develop exemplification training and standardization materials for local authority moderators. Above all, they're passionate about pupils writing and about supporting the development of young writers, which is what led them to the creation of the Bite Into Writing materials. I'm really happy to say that we're also joined today by Susanna Bailey. Susanna is the author of the highly acclaimed novel Otter's Moon, which is the quality published text at the heart of Bite Into Writing Book 3. You might perhaps know of Susanna's first novel, Snowfowl, or have heard about her soon to be published third novel, Raven Winter. Susanna also lectures in creative writing at Bath Spa University. Susanna, welcome. We're really delighted to have you with us. During the webinar, there'll be two writer's perspective spots where we'll be asking Susanna to offer her own thoughts about how to inspire creative writing. So there's plenty to look forward to, and I'm now going to hand over to Margaret and Joe, who are going to start us off by tackling the question of what we exactly mean by quality text. Yes, thank you, Francis. So, of course, we've built Bite Into Writing on a very firm foundation of quality texts, with each resource being based on a quality published text and each also containing two spotlight texts that are inspired by and complement the published text. So it's worth taking a moment to, to just think about what we actually mean by a quality text, because it is a term that's quite frequently and quite widely used. And of course, there are there are so many truly exceptional children's books available. And, and we knew that when it came to choosing the published texts for Bite Into Writing, we would need to be absolutely clear and transparent about what we meant by that term and what we were looking for. So we actually put together a list of criteria, a set of criteria which we'll just have a quick look at now. So the first one, um, quite an obvious one really, was is it suitable for the target group of readers? But of course we had potentially a very wide target group of readers, year six pupils in classrooms across the country and maybe even internationally. So each book we chose needed to engage pupils from possibly very different backgrounds and appeal to different genders and needed to be both accessible but also sufficiently challenging to readers of different abilities. And we, we were very mindful of diversity and inclusion. And we asked ourselves, does, does it have the potential to promote high quality discussion? This was important because the talk and explore activities are a key element of Bite Into Writing. You know, they, they support pupils in articulating their thoughts, in developing the skills of reading comprehension, and of course they act as a springboard into writing. So each book needed to offer, or have the potential to offer, really rich opportunities for high quality talk stemming for example from exploration of themes and conventions 
and it needed to support a range of writing. Of course, this was essential. Um, it was really essential that each book would support a wide, really wide range of writing, both fiction and non-fiction, for different purposes and different audiences, and using different levels of formality. And we did decide to include both fiction and non-fiction, even though clearly a, a fiction book can inspire non-fiction writing and, and vice versa. And then we asked is there scope to make connections with other texts? And this also was, was extremely important because we include a list of thematically linked texts in each bite into writing resource. And this is obviously to promote wider independent reading, but also to support teachers with the national curriculum requirement for pupils to make comparisons across books. So it might be possible, for example, to explore different perspectives on a common theme, such as children's experiences during wartime or the issues that threaten our planet. And we also wanted the scope to make connections with other areas of the curriculum too, such as history, geography, science, art, PSHE, so that the activities would lend themselves to those really rich cross-curricular experiences. And then we, we asked ourselves, is, is it written by a well-regarded children's writer? Yeah, we, we tended to look for writers who had clear credentials in terms of writing for this age group. Um, we were mindful of writers that teachers would be familiar with and whose books might already be on their classroom bookshelves. But we were also on the lookout for exciting new authors and perhaps our guest today, Susanna Bailey, might fall into this category because both Otter's Moon and her first novel, Snowfall, did catch our attention, having received really outstanding reviews. And then finally, we asked ourselves, is, is, this, is it likely to stand the test of time? And what we meant by that was that, you know, we, we felt it was really important for each book we chose to have a, a good shelf life. So not only in terms of school budgets, but in terms of teachers planning time and teaching resources. So we were really keen to find either recently published books or books that were or perhaps had the potential to become classic reads. So eventually, after reading many, many books, we finally decided on the quality published text for each bite into writing resource. And Margaret's going to tell us about the three that we chose and also look at some of the pupils' writing they inspired in the schools that, that used the materials. One of three stories, um, one of three stories uh, from the book When We Were Warriors by Emma Carroll. And this is a really gripping adventure story. Um, it's set in World War II, um, and it's an ideal class read, particularly if you would like to link uh, a, a class read to that particular topic. It features feisty children, uh, a, a somewhat wayward dog, uh, a, mis a case of mistaken identity, a foiled German invasion and a really thrilling race against time. And we've been really delighted by feedback that we've had from teachers who have told us how much their pupils loved the characters and the plot of this particular story. So inspired by um, Olive's Army, we have here some very different pieces of writing about character. And all of these were preceded in the classroom by plenty of talk and role play and discussion. And as you can see on the top left, 
there is some initial planning, focusing on some traits of one of the main characters, uh, in this case, Suki. And this leads into a brief character description, which you can just see below there. And then on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see some writing in role through the eyes of this character at a key point in the story. And it's just worth pointing out here that Suki is not the narrator in Emma Carroll's story. So the pupil has had to adopt the persona of a different character here. And these preparatory descriptions will therefore have really helped this pupil to get into role. And then here we have a, a more substantial piece, and this time written in the style of the author and through the, store, the eyes of the story's narrator, Olive. And the piece expands on a pivotal scene in the story, and it clearly reflects the way the author builds tension. So we have the moments of despair. How could about 10 people stop hundreds of Germans? And we have the race against time. We needed to be faster. Followed by the inevitable panic. It was terrifying. I froze. And then finally, the writer's own dramatic ending. Just Suki standing there, looking down. And of course, as Joe touched on earlier, a fiction book can also inspire non-fiction writing, such as this formal incident report. And again, it's written in role as a character from the story, and this time an American soldier who was present at the scene of the German invasion, or rather the attempted German invasion. And this piece is based on and very much rooted in the story, but it's also supported by one of the spotlight texts from Bite into Writing, and Joe's going to talk a little bit more about those later. Then, to ensure a balance of fiction and non-fiction, the second book we chose was Everest, the remarkable story of Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. And this was written by Alexandra Stewart and beautifully illustrated by Joe Todd Stanton. It offers a, a real life, a quite a gripping real life account of how two men from very different backgrounds came to conquer the highest mountain in the world. But it's more than just that story. It's also packed with fascinating facts different text types and an array of presentational features and pupils really picked up on this multimedia approach and it certainly inspired some creativity including this newspaper report but as well as this pupils produced some highly visual pieces such as a graphic representation of a pyramid of human effort complete with captions an illustrated spoof web page offering evidence for the existence of the Yeti, and a multimedia fact sheet about the explorer, Ranulf Fiennes, who actually wrote the foreword to the book. It also inspired a number of letters written for very different purposes and audiences, and therefore requiring very different levels of formality from informal letters to family, as you can see on the right, to a relatively formal request seeking Norgay's services for the 1953 British expedition on Everest. And then through to a highly formal letter and recommendation for a bravery award. For the third book, we chose Otter's Moon by our guest today, Susanna Bailey. 
we were really keen to include a longer novel in our offer. And ideally, this would be a multi-layered story with the potential to work on different levels. On one level, this is a story about two children who rescue a wild creature. They nurse it and return it to the wild. But it's so much more than this. It's an absorbing mystery. It's an exploration of family conflicts and relationships and of unlikely friendships and then the healing power of nature. And it's all wrapped up within exquisite prose. As we've already seen, novels provide the perfect vehicle to inspire writing in role and diary entries always seem to capture pupils' imagination particularly when they identify strongly with the character they're portraying. Here, this pupil writes in role as Meg, the fiercely protective island girl in Otter's Moon. And they've chosen to write her diary entries at different points in the novel. So they've recorded her thoughts and feelings as the story unfolds. That this continual engagement with the character can help pupils develop a strong and authentic writer's voice and can promote a deeper understanding of a protagonist's attitude and actions. And then speech and thought bubbles also provide a vehicle for pupils to write in role and they can often support less confident writers to plan and develop dialogue. Monologues encourage pupils to focus on the essence of a character, to consider how their thoughts and feelings might determine their behaviour. In the speech bubble on the left, the character of Luke reveals the reasons for his growing anger, whilst the internal monologue on the right focuses on different points in the novel and captures his mother's inner voice as she reveals her hopes and her fears. Of course, letters, postcards, emails, and even telegrams enable pupils to step into role whilst considering the intending recipient or audience, such as here, where Luke writes to a friend, bemoaning his enforced stay on the island at an early point in the novel. And as we've already seen, fiction texts can also inspire a range of non-fiction writing too. In these information leaflets, pupils draw on their own research, adopting the voice of an expert to present an array of engaging facts about some of the wildlife that feature in the novel. Whilst here, the emphasis is on persuasion linking a very current topic to the environmental concerns voiced by Meg as she strives to clear the shoreline of litter in order to safeguard the otters. Often, a text can inspire artwork as well as writing, such as here, where pupils were asked to sketch the author's description of the scene at the waterfall before then using it to support their own description of a beautiful natural place. And as I mentioned earlier, the prose in Otter's Moon is exquisite, often drawing on figurative language to create an evocative sense of place. In this piece, the teacher had taken the class to a, a wild nature spot so that children could get a feel for and sketch the area. They used the drawings and also some photographs that they took to support their writing. And they revisited examples of figurative language and discussed ways in which it could be used to enhance their descriptions. Often, these snippets of incidental writing such as description and dialogue, can feed into an extended piece, as can be seen here, where the pupil has written an imaginative reconstruction 
in the style of the author, drawing independently on what they have read as a model for their own writing. Thank you so much, Jo and Margaret. That was fantastic and so interesting to see all those exciting examples of how children have used the text as a jumping off point in so many different ways for their own writing. So now it's time for the first writer's perspective spot, which I mentioned earlier. And I'm really pleased that we're joined for this by Susanna, author of Otter's Moon, which we can see inspired so much wonderful creativity from the pupils. So Susanna, welcome. First of all, can I ask you, did you ever envisage a teaching resource being based on one of your books? And how do you feel about that? Or inviting me. I mean, the answer to that is a resounding no. I mean, I was overwhelmed when I first heard about Otter's Moon and Bite into Writing, and I still am. Um, such an honour to have my work chosen um, using the kind of criteria that you've just been articulating. And ever more exciting every time I see some of the wonderful children's work that's been that's been a response to it and the creative way that children and teachers are using my text. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, actually. It's it's a wonderful thing. It's an enormous privilege. It, it really and I'm very excited about it. That's that's great to hear. And I was also wondering when you're planning a novel. What kind of research do you do in that process? And would you recommend that young writers should do research as part of their preparation for writing? Um, the amount of, of research I do depends on the type of novel, really. Um, but I always do research and I'm going to define research quite broadly. And I'm going to answer your other question straight away, which is to say yes, yes, yes to children doing it because research for me is so much more than finding out factual information that you might need to incorporate in a book. It's the way that you allow your story to grow and breathe and build. Um, and without research, I don't think I'd be writing very much at all. So um, typically for my three novels, research can be anything from visiting actual places where the story is going to be set or similar to those places, online searches, reading textbooks, reading other novels that write around that kind of story idea or that kind of place. I might um, sketch scenes and develop um, a, sort of, a sort of combination of a scenery that I've seen online or in fact and, and add my imagination in. I call that research too. I might need to draw maps, plot routes for where my children need to move around. I certainly had to do that in Snowfall because I was actually writing about Exmoor and, and real places. Um, I would probably um, include in research, research in my own characters in my own head. So trying to get my get to know them by letting them speak, perhaps letting them speak to me in a monologue, just letting them ramble on in my head, writing it all down without judgment, finding out about them. And it's amazing how they can surprise you with things that they tell you that you didn't know that you've then got to incorporate in the story. Um, I do lists of characters, likes and dislikes. I try to build a backstory for them. Um, but in terms of factual information, even when I'm writing something which is purely imaginary, such as Otter's Moon. So in Otter's Moon, I was writing about a fictitious Scottish island. But in order to create my scenes, in order to understand what my characters would see, hear and know and touch on a daily basis, I need to explore information about real Scottish islands, the sort of landscapes, the sort of histories, the kind of wildlife that they would see there. Um, and I also needed to find out quite a lot of information about otters, because one thing about being a children's writer is you know you've got to get things right um, in terms of that kind of information. But I think what arises out of that that I find really exciting is once you start, once I start 
engaging with the factual information, you know, looking at films, for instance, of um, people, people's lives on remote Scottish Island, looking at nature documentaries about otters, looking at um, some of the history of these islands, some of the mythology around them, the wonderful sea stories that have gathered over the years, it suggested for me scenes, it suggested uh, plot points, it created for me um, the whole idea of the mysterious Otter's Moon weather front that is the, the, set, the centre of the story. Um, so that kind of factual research, immersing myself in realities, gave me ideas that, that fed my imagination and, and really built the story, actually, built the components of the story. Um, so I, I think really important to do, and I'm just checking my notes because I'm sure there are other things that I've forgotten. Um, well, I was going to say, Susanna, thank you. I mean, there's so many inspiring ideas there, and it's great to get those those insights about um, about research and all those all those possibilities there. Um, and finally, for now, um, you'll have noticed in the great examples of people's writing that Joe and Margaret were showing um, just before that the writing actually included edits that the pupils had made to their own work. And I just wondered whether you could share just a little bit. Um, about how you edit your own writing. I will, yes, the E word. <laughs> That's like Sarah in everybody's soul. I know children always ask me about that, actually. Do you have to edit your work? In, in reality, I mean, um, I don't know whether children know that when, before a novel is actually published and becomes a nice little book that you can pick off a shelf, not only has the author done several rounds of edits, but publishers, editors have spent weeks, if not months, doing rounds of edits for things like story structure and character and imagery and punctuation and, and all those things. So it's a really, really long, long process. And authors don't write the perfect book that you see when you, you know, when you pick up Otter's Moon in, in, in your classroom. It isn't me that made it as, as perfect as it is on the page with all the correct punctuation and spelling and everything else. There's a lot of people involved and, and a lot of stages to the editing process. But for myself, I tend to edit as I go, and that might be literally editing each paragraph as I go before I move on to the next. It might be editing a page at a time, where some authors don't edit at all till they've written the whole story because they find it, it gets in the way of their imagination. But I'm I'm a bit too scared to leave it to the end. I, I find I've got to try and make things as, as, as you know as, as best as I can if I can put it that way before I can move on um and I suppose when I'm looking at a particular paragraph or a particular scene I'm I'm looking for several different things I'm looking at my imagery my sort of metaphors and the simile that I've used and I'm looking to see if I've sort of gone for the easy reach gone for something familiar that people would have read often before and, and if that's the case, it probably won't have much of an impact. So then I'll look to see if I can find a better one, something that might stop readers in their tracks or, you know, something they might remember, something that will better convey that moment or, or that thing that I want them to be looking at or feeling. Um, I often, I don't know if this will work in a classroom, but I often read out loud I'm editing because I'm trying to listen to the sort of rhythm of the prose that I'm writing, almost as if it was a piece of music, to see if it will feel satisfying to read. But also, if I find if if I'm stumbling as I'm reading, I've probably not punctuated something correctly, or I've used a kind of clunky phrase, and I'll go back and see if I can find that. If I can't read, it probably means I've forgotten some punctuation. I might need to put a, a comma in or a full stop. But I'm also think, trying to think of punctuation and grammar as something a bit more exciting as part of my sort of creative tool set. And this is something I talk about with my own students because nobody likes grammar and punctuation, do they? But I think to myself, if by adding in some punctuation, I might be able to um, give a better sense of the atmosphere that I'm trying to create in that scene. If I might be able to put the reader more accurately, it more accurately in that scene and in the feeling of the scene. So, for instance, short sentences 
are more suited to a sort of tense, scary, breathy kind of scene. Whereas longer sentences give more of a sense of something more relaxed or sort of lyrical and poetic, or perhaps might describe a scene where we're talking about, you know, sea waves rolling onto a shore or something. Um, mm. If I, I look to see if I can move the words around on the page, perhaps if I move that sentence into a little paragraph of its own, is it going to give the sort of jump start, the sort of shock that I want the character to be experiencing and the reader to be experiencing there? If I put three short, very short paragraphs one after another, might I create that sort of dump, dump, dump dramatic moment that we sometimes see, you know, in a TV program? So I, I guess I'm I'm looking at, at that kind of thing really. Um, and I'm also looking to see if I remembered to talk about setting and not just have a, a sort of list of, of dialogue, lots of people talking suspended in midair, which I can do if I get carried away hearing my character speak. Um, and whether I remembered to show which character is speaking each time. So lots of different things going on there. There's a lot of things there, Susanna, and thank you so much for those insights. Um, we're going to catch up again with Susanna a little bit later on in the webinar. Um, but now we're going to rejoin Jo and Margaret, who are also thinking about the writer's craft. And in particular, they're going to be considering how we can equip pupils with the tools that they need to develop as young writers. So over to Jo and Margaret. Thanks, Francis. I was just so excited, Susanna, um, just hearing you talk about punctuation and grammar as part of your creative tool set. Um, I just think that that's, that's wonderful because, you know, of course, as well as inspiring pupils to write, we also need to equip them with the tools they need to become young writers. So, you know, we, we need to empower them to see themselves as writers to to read as a writer in other words to read with a writerly eye and to write as a reader to write with their reader or their audience in mind and that's why we need to teach the writer's craft you know being inspired to write and having the tools to do so is such a powerful combination so we wrote two spotlight texts we call them spotlight texts for each Bite into writing resource. And they represent different text types and different levels of formality across the six, sorry, across the three bite into writing books. Um, so there are six spotlight texts altogether. And they're designed to, to demonstrate or to model some of the typical features of those text types, but with the focus very firmly on the choices made by the writer to suit the purpose and audience. And they sit alongside the quality published text, drilling down into, if you like, shining a spotlight on the writer's craft. You can see two of them here on this slide. So these are from Bite Into Writing Book 3, the, the book that features Otter's Moon. So you can see there's an information text about the Black Guillemot, that's the, the black bird that Luke finds so menacing in Otter's Moon. And there's a persuasive text promoting a holiday on a remote Scottish island. Again, that's inspired by uh, Susanna's island setting in Otter's Moon. We also wrote teaching prompts. So the teaching prompts accompany each spotlight text. And you can see an example here on this slide. Um, they draw explicit attention to those features. So the features of the writer's craft, we, we chose text organization and structure, vocabulary choices, grammatical structures, punctuation, you can see why I got excited um, by what Susanna was saying, and the writer's voice. And they're intended to help teachers not only develop their own grammatical understanding, but essentially to support pupils' understanding of the writer's craft because it is all crafted, as, as Susanna said, you know, it, it doesn't just happen naturally. And it's this explicit knowledge that we believe can help young writers to move beyond imitation to independent application, for example, if they're writing in the style of an author. And of course, it's learning 
that can then be transferred to their engagement with and their enjoyment of the published text, becoming better readers and better writers as a result. Joe, thank you so much for that interesting look at the tools of writing and how we can help pupils to, as you put it so well, read as a writer and also write as a reader. So now I'm going to be joined again by Susanna for her writer's perspective. Susanna, we saw a bit earlier in the webinar that Otis Moon has clearly inspired and stimulated pupils to write so many different kinds of texts. But we all know that children, and I have to say also, in my experience, adults can find it really hard to actually generate ideas for writing in the first place. So I wondered whether this ever happens to you as a writer, and if so, whether you've got any ideas that might help pupils to get started with their own piece of writing. Thank you. I do have lots of ideas, and this is where you might have to shut me up, actually. <laughs> because this is an issue that I have every time I sit down at my keyboard and, and it's something that's very common to authors, even very successful authors will tell you that there is a sort of paralysis that comes from looking at a blank page or a blinking cursor on a, on a laptop and we all have to develop lots of ways to get around it. Um, I, I mean, I guess it, one of the things that helps me and I think it helps some of the students I work with is, is to try and understand that you don't need to know exactly what you're going to write about when you start. You don't need an entire story. You can begin with a tiny fragment of an idea, a picture in your head of a person, a place, a couple of words that are buzzing around. Just put them down and see what happens. That's the beginning of the story, just those tiny seeds. I mean, I, I like a lot of writers, I have a notebook in which I just collect things. And I don't know if this is something that children can do. They might feel a bit like a secret agent, um, but that's quite a quite a cool thing to be anyway. But just to collect scraps of scraps of conversation, to write down interesting things that they see, things they might hear in a TV program or a film, just to or strange words that strike them, anything, or a little sketch of a funny animal they see just to keep those so that when they're stuck for ideas, they can look at them. Um, I don't know if that if that works for children within a classroom environment, but it's something a lot of writers do. Um, and the smallest thing can sort of spin off an idea, really. For me, the, the sort of seeds of my books really come from things that have happened in my real life. So reflecting back from it's all about reflecting back for me to when I was a child some of the things that happened to me, the way I felt as a child, the things that have happened in the lives of children and adults that I've known in my life or through my work. And I suppose that's relevant for children because it's out of those sort of ordinary things that happen in our day that, that stories can come, you know, a, an argument with a friend, something that happens in the playground, your house move that you're dreading, something that you've lost, something that you're hoping for, those are the seeds of stories that you know we can all relate to. So I always think it's worth talking to students about just think back to what's going on in your own life. What is there there that other people might relate to that might have the beginnings of a story? But in terms of sort of more sort of practical things, I like to flip through um, photographs, paintings, um, pictures and other books. I Often, if I'm really stuck, pick up a favourite book that I love and read sections of that again. It sort of, I don't know, it lights the, the word fires in my head or something and um, puts me back into that sort of love of, of, of writing that I might lose in those frozen, frozen moments. Um, but uh, one of the things that I do find I use quite a lot and that, that children I like to do if they don't already is instead of starting um, with a, a pen or a pencil in hand or a laptop to actually write words is to draw, um, is to use a sketchbook and is to just sketch what's in my head without judging it, whether I can sort of see a little bit of a scene or a face or an animal um, and then I might add the odd word that comes to me or a little speech bubble, something like that. I might find myself drawing a bit of a scene and there's something about just using crayons and pens and lovely colours that is less threatening. I'm not really writing a story yet, I'm just playing. 
So I do, and um, David Armand of, you know, our, our esteemed David Armand does that with every piece of writing he does. So I've copied him really. Um, and I'll go back to that if I get stuck on a particular scene or partway through a book, which I nearly always do. And I, I feel that frees me up. Um, I might also use mood boards, I think, just collect. Mm -hmm. something perhaps children could do, just sort of collect interesting images and pictures, either with good old fashioned scissors and glue or, you know, a, a, um, so digitally cut and paste and just create a really interesting collection of images that might inspire a story and see how many different stories can come out of that if, if a group is working on, on that. Mm -hmm. Um, Susanna, so many great ideas there, and I can I can hear people agreeing with the idea that stories can just come from very very ordinary things, um, and it's so helpful to have you know have that discussed. And um, thank you so much for that, um, and for sharing all your insights with us during the webinar. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we're now going to move on um, to the Q and A section of the webinar. Um, but as we take a look at the questions, we also wanted to ask you what you feel might be your biggest challenge in teaching writing. Um, and if there are any common themes that emerge, you may well inspire the topic of our next webinar. So please do feel free to have a think about this as we go along and type any thoughts at all that you may have into the chat. Um, so now we've got a little bit of time um, left just for I think a very few questions um, so let's go first of all to uh, a question for um, Jo and Margaret now um, this question Jo and Margaret is about criteria um, you said that you put together a set of criteria when you were choosing your quality texts um, is this something that you would expect um, schools to do as well? Shall I take that um, one? <laughs> I don't I'll mind. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one then. Right. Um, thanks, Francis. That's a really good question. I, I actually think teachers tend to do this quite intuitively, actually. They might not realise they're doing it, but they are. I think they often have an implicit sense of what makes a good class read um, based on their knowledge of their pupils, first and foremost. But I, I do believe there's a difference between a great independent read and a good whole class text. Um, and I, I think we said earlier that we, we read so many books when we were, were choosing the published text for writing to writing. Um, and, you know, they were all fantastic books, but we knew that some of them just weren't quite what we were looking for in terms of a, a class read. Um, so I suppose for schools, it, probably wouldn't hurt to formalise it just a little bit. So, you know, it might be a good use of a staff meeting to to just sit and agree as a school what you're looking for in a whole class text, just as Margaret and I sat down and thought about what we were really looking for. Um, and, you know, that would really then support consistency and ensure progression through the year groups in the school as well. So. Yeah, I would say I think it's probably already happening, but probably could, you know, it's it would be good to just think it through um, and think about that process. Thanks, Joe. That's really helpful to know. Um, and um, here's another question. Um, and this time it's about the spotlight text. So can you say a little bit more um, about how the spotlight text can be used to to teach the writer's craft? Um, Will I take that one, Joe? So, yeah, um, as Joe said, we, we have six spotlight texts across the three resource books, um, two in each, uh, and we have a real range of texts here. We have a, a formal incident report, a newspaper report, an information text, a promotional leaflet. Uh, we have a first person flashback narrative. And we have a semi formal letter of request and 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 we keep the spotlight text deliberately quite short. Um, they're just typically one or two pages. And, and the reason for this is that we wanted teachers to to have a have an additional resource which could easily be shared with the whole class. 
Uh, for example, you might want to use them on a visualizer or an interactive whiteboard. Um, you might want to do some annotation with the whole class. You, might, you could, for example, do some teasing out and exploration of some of the language features, uh, some of the grammar that's used, a bit like Susanna was saying earlier, um, thinking about the impact that the grammar and the punctuation has on, on the reader. Um, but, but also we know that one a, a very effective um, means of supporting children with their writing is, is in guided learning. So we felt that the, the spotlight text could also be used with a, a small guided group um, where perhaps pupils could highlight some of the text themselves and, and then begin to share their ideas and, and, and create a group discussion uh, again around um, the writer's craft, which, which is so important. Um, and, and we really do recommend that, that using the spotlight text, the focus is very much on, on the language and the structure that support purpose and audience. And the teaching prompts that we've included with them will really help to do that uh, and can be shared with pupils in a, in a very informative and, and helpful way. Um, but also they can support teacher modelling. Uh, and, uh, and we know that in teacher modeling, modeling to the whole class or to a guided group, it's not always that easy. And, and here I think the, the, the prompts themselves can really help you to go through that process of thinking aloud and explaining the choices that, that you would make as a writer. So I think there are so many ways in which they can be used. They're very versatile and, and they can definitely help to teach that, that writer's craft that's so important. Thank you very much, Margaret. That's really, really very helpful um, information about this spotlight text. And um, just to draw things to to a close, we've unfortunately we're we've, we're very short of time now. But just one final question brings us on to the to the very last slide of the um, presentation. Um, and this is a question about um, previous webinars because I, I mentioned at the beginning this is one of three Bite into Writing webinars. And um, just to confirm that we will circulate the links to those previous webinars um, after this webinar so that everybody has got access to those if they would like to have them. So as we draw to a close, um, I just want to reiterate, if you have a question that hasn't been covered um, or if you have suggestions for another webinar, um, here are some ways to get in touch with us. Um, please do email the NFER classroom team and you'll find us at um, the web address on the screen there. Um, and also on this screen, you can see different ways of accessing information about the Byte into Writing suite of materials if, if you'd like to do that. Um, so our time is uh, sadly drawing to a close now. Um, it just remains for me to thank very much Joe, Margaret and Susanna for their time today and for sharing all of their insights. And I'd like to thank everybody who's joined us for attending and participating. And we hope to welcome you back to the NFER sometime soon.